Good afternoon or good noon, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Uh, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Stephen Hansen. I'm the Director of Graduate Studies here at the Tulane's uh, uh, Program in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. Um, I will uh, not, I'll, I'll waste a few moments of your time talking about our program in a few minutes, but first I wanna hand this over to David Dukas uh, to discuss uh, this, this wonderful lecture series that we have. And I, David, will share my screen and hopefully we can just move like that. There we are. So I'm very pleased to have both Dr. Shepard and Ray joining us to talk about the pain of medical inequity and examination of pain perception and the treatment disparities in medicine. This is brought to you by the J.R. Williams Senior MD Class of 1931 Endowed Lecture Series. The lecture series was uh, initiated in 2013. The endowment uh, supports the lectures on spirituality and health in Tul at Tulane University School of Medicine, looking particularly at the art of creating a compassionate and trusting relationship between patient and doctor. The series honors the legacy of J. Richard Williams Sr. This was actually done by his son and actually is carried on as a legacy with uh, J. Richard Williams III, uh, Tulane University get graduate, who was a very well-known and well-loved internist and oncologist in Selma, Alabama. As you may not realize, but it'll come to you quickly back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, unfortunately, a lot of oncology turned into palliative care and Dr. Williams's love of medicine was one of those uh, things that was emblematic for all of his patients, that he was the kind of doctor who would do anything for his patient. But as a result of this palliative aspect of his oncology practice, he had a specific interest in the impact of spirituality on health and particularly on the positive impact of spirituality on the well-being and continued health of those who had suffered the loss of a loved one. Stephen. Thank you. Um, in addition to uh, the, the J. Uh, Williams lecture series, we are uh, co-sponsors of this talk, the Masters in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. Um, I'll give you a very brief uh, discussion of uh, description of what we are, but if you want to find out more, tulane.edu slash bioethics or Tulane Bioethics on YouTube. Um, we are more than uh, uh, happy to talk to you about it. We'll get to that in a minute, uh, give you my emails and everything. But I want to give you just a brief idea. This is a program in bioethics and medical humanities, and there's so much in that that we really have divided it into two tracks. We have a bioethics track, which focuses on the ethical aspects of things, training people for ethics committees, uh, IRBs, that sort of thing, or just knowing more about ethics. And the medical humanities track that looks at what does narrative, what does film, what does uh, 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 history and art uh, tell us about medicine that we can't really get at just by the, the logical looking at things uh, that maybe philosophy would like to do or, or clinical uh, science would like to do. What do we learn from that? And there's, that's our medical humanities track. Um, we try to be really flexible in this. We have a one year or a two year way to take the class, to take our full master's program. So we try to be as flexible as possible, especially for people who are taking this as mid-career professionals. We also can extend this well beyond one or two years for people who need to take in a shorter, uh, a smaller number of courses on a regular basis. We have a dual degree program with Tulane School of Medicine where you can complete both the MD and the MS in the same four years that you would normally complete your MD in. Um, and we have starting in the fall, we will be authoring, offering three graduate certificates, one in clinical ethics, one in research ethics, and one in medical humanities. And if you dip your toe in with these uh, certificates and you say, wow, I really wanna know more, I really can't, I really, this isn't enough, you can build on one of these certificates or actually build on two of these certificates, stack them and work your way all the way to the full master's degree if you so desire. Um, I said I'd get to this bit. This is, by all means, drop us uh, a, an email. 
uh, at shansen4 at tulane.edu. That's me, Stephen Hansen. Sophie Tofengenden is our program manager and also one of our fine faculty, tofengenden at tulane.edu. And again, the link, we try to make it as simple as possible, tulane.edu slash bioethics to learn more about who we are. Um, we're very excited to be able to uh, offer uh, this lecture series and uh, very excited to be able to be uh, participants in it. So without any further ado, let me go ahead and introduce one of our students who was instrumental in getting this talk uh, organized. Um, and in fact, let me go ahead and stop my share and just just uh, let's let's go ahead and, and hand it right off to her. Dr. Tracy Wilson, would you please, uh, uh, would you please? Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Tracy Wilson. I am a proud student of Tulane University here in the Bioethics and Medical Humanities program. I would not be here without these two fine ladies. Dr. Shepard um, was actually one of the ones who actually introduced me to medical humanities and um, bioethics. And Dr. Ray has actually helped me during my matriculation in this program in bioethics. So like I said, without these two ladies, I would not be here today. So let me introduce you to them right now. Professor Dr. Keisha Ray had received her PhD in philosophy from the University of Utah. She is currently an assistant professor with McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics at the University of Texas Health Houston, where she also serves as the, as the Director of Medical Humanities Scholarly Concentration. Most of Dr. Ray's work focuses on the social and political determinants of Black people's health, integrating race education into medical school curricula and the ethics of biomedical enhancement. She has contributed to journals like Journal of Medical Humanities, Pediatrics, Hastings Center Report, AJOB Neuroscience, as well as edited volumes and textbooks. She currently has the monograph Black Health in Progress contracted with Oxford University Press. Dr. Ray also serves as an associate editor of the American Journal of Bioethics blog site to which she is a, also a regular contributor. Dr. Amani Shepard is currently the co-director of Medical Ethics and Humanities Thread at the University of Illinois or at Urbana Champaign Carl College of Medicine where she is also an assistant teaching professor and a medical education facilitator. In addition to the A, um, a for noted, Dr. Shepard is the director of medical education and social scientific research at the Medical Humanities and Health Disparities Institute, where she, is, where she works with community organizations to help build medical educational materials and develop health and wellness programming for sustainability. This work is supplemented by her membership as a member of Xavier's University's Community Advisory Board for the College of Pharmacy Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities Research and Education. Over the last 10 years, Dr. Shepard has authored the text, Health, Healing, and Hurricane Katrina, a, crit a critical analysis of psychosomatic illness in survivors sold in more than seven countries, embodied trauma and the dissociation of the self in dark denials and domestic violence was supplemental author of anthropology textbook, What Does It Mean to Be Human? as well as written numerous encyclopedia art articles and several poems in Kaiser Permanente Journal. Her forthcoming book entitled The Parallax, a medical progress is due out September of 2022. So as we can see, we have a wealth of knowledge that's in front of us. So I'm excited to see what we're gonna hear from these two ladies right now. So what I'll do, I'll turn it over now to Dr. Amani Shepard, who will then be followed by Dr. Keisha Ray. So thank you both. All right, thanks so much, 
Dr. Wilson and Dr. Hansen. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully all of this will go smoothly. You know, we, we're, we've all been Zooming a lot, so we do what we can. <laughs> we're hoping everything goes smoothly. I'm also really happy um, when I can do a presentation with people who are in New Orleans, because y'all know, you know, we don't tell a short story. So <laughs> we kind of go off and um, that's always a, a beautiful thing. So I am in Illinois, but miss y'all from afar. So there's a couple of things, right? So let me, um, again, we're looking at the pain and medical inequity and examination of pain perception and treatment disparities in medicine. And um, as Dr. Wilson noted, I will be specifically looking at the ways in which um, history and those histographies within the culture and praxis and epistemologies of medicine have informed um, contemporary praxis um, and epistemologies, which is what Dr. Ray will get into, which is one of the reasons why I decided to use this little, <laughs> this little moving image, right? Um, because it does a, a really good job of being able to articulate the ways in which, again, um, works like Aristotle's work and Plato's work and all of these people that we hold in very high esteem, which, you know, I always get side eyes, but these were terrible, terrible people, <laughs> right? The way the, the work of these individuals um, and the epistemologies that come out of their work inform much of medical inequity. Um, and so I'll kind of bring you through that process. But before we begin, one of the things that I think is um, really important to keep in mind is that the culture and praxis and the knowledges that are embedded in medicine are often articulated relative to natural law, right? This idea that it is all objective and that um, clinicians, physicians, anybody who is embedded within um, the, the community and the culture of medicine um, are all objective, right? Um, and that there are no subjectivities built into the praxis of medicine. And that's really interesting because even if we think of Paracelsius's work, you, you come to this idea that medicine in and of itself is defined by specific groups of people, right? Not everything qualifies as being um, medicine or praxis of medicine. We also see things like issues with the GFR and equitable access to um, kidney transplants. We see inequitable access to um, mental health facilities. We see all kinds of medical inequities that actually come out of very specific ide um, a very specific ideological framework, right? Um, that we tend to disregard because it has been normalized, it has been legitimized. So it's not something that we tend to think of immediately um, because we are so uh, indoctrinated, because we are just embedded in these practices. So we take them for, um, for the way that we have been socialized to believe. So with that in mind, I am always, this is one of the first places that I go um, because I think that we don't spend enough time talking about um, the foundations of much of the knowledges um, relative to the praxis of medicine, relative to the epistemologies of medicine. And the great chain of being is one of those things. The great chain of being comes out of Aristotle's work and specifically it is from the, um, what is it, the Scala Natura, which essentially says that all living um, animate and inanimate objects can be categorized, right? And the closer that an organism or thing is to God, because remember that medicine and science and religion were all folded up, um, I'll say in the very beginning, right? Um, and they informed each other. So the great chain of being simply suggested that the closer an individual got to um, God, the more civilized they will be. Um, the other thing that is noted, though, is that this idea of being close to God brought with it this notion of pain, that that was a part of the original sin, and that only individuals that were close to God, only individuals that were perceived as having a degree of humanity and civility um, would be able to tap into what pain was. Pain was actually directly associated with suffering, right? And so you had to have a certain cognitive and intellectual capacity to understand suffering and thus understand pain. What's interesting um, in this case, however, is that African peoples were not considered human. They actually, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not, but they existed right between human and beast. 
were often articulated as being um, the missing link or an aspect of the missing link existing between the human self, which is when we talk about race during this time period or the race of man, we're specifically talking about the human self, not race in the way that we contemporarily understand that, because we don't see race and or racism in the contemporary way until the enlightenment, right? Which is again, interesting because this is a time period that we hold in very high esteem and things like race and racism come out of that. So people of African ancestry, Africans at the time were discussed as existing between human and beast. And in many instances, they were specifically noted as being beast. The implication of this is um, nociception which is the idea that because an individual was farther from God, because they were not tapped into the race of man, e.g. their own humanity, that they could not actually experience pain. What they could experience was nociception, was this idea that um, you have a neurological response, right? A sort of intuitive response in the way that a beast or a lobster might experience, you know, an intuitive response if you put it in hot water, right? Um, but it's not experiencing suffering. And because it's not experiencing suffering, it's not experiencing pain, it's experiencing misoception, or just a neurological response to what is going on. So this is just that very, very, very beginning aspect that simply says that if an individual or if an organism is not closer to God and thus non-human, which is where Africans were situated, then they could not experience pain. And so we see parts of this. Let's get to, there it is. We see snippets of this existing through time and space. Whether you're talking about the earlier part of the Renaissance where you have um, actually right before the Renaissance, where you have Jacob Bont's orangutan, which he had never seen one, right? This is about um, a couple of things, anthropomorphizing the notion of an orangutan, but also articulating what the African foreign body is, right? This individual is not a part of the race of man and thus humanity and thus cannot experience pain, but only can experience nociception because they are part beast, part man, right? And you see lots of organisms that are situated um, within that great chain of being, the darker they got, the farther they got from um, being associated with God, being associated with pain, being able to tap into the cognitive aspects of suffering. And so Jacob Bont's orangutan does that work. Um, as well as Knotts and Glidden's notion of the missing link, because the normalization of the body um, was specifically that of the white Greek male, right? We still see that. If you ever look up, you can go to PubMed right now um, and look up any medical research and it always says compared to their white counterparts, right? And the idea was that this was the apex of humanity and that black bodies, individuals of brown skin, were considered the missing link between the normalized white Greek male and the pantroglodyte or the, the common chimp. So again, within that great chain of being, and this is about a hundred, you know, well, um, more than a hundred years later, way more than a hundred years later, um, what you end up seeing is the re-articulation of the great chain of being through time and space. This also facilitated human zoos um, which we don't talk about for whatever reason, because we would have to know causality, because we would have to articulate that what we're saying is that specific individuals do not um, have entree to their own humanity, that they do not have entree to specific um, relative to this talk, to this notion of pain because they do not have access to a certain cognitive capacity, because they do not have access to suffering, right? So it ends up being this very tautological argument. Um, and, and many people are like, well, how could we believe this thing? But what has happened within the culture and praxis of medicine is we've all become, I often say, we've all just become like Galen's followers, right? Galen was the individual who said when he introduced the circulatory system that the heart had holes in it that allowed for um, an individual's soul to move through the holes in the heart and move around. No one actually thought to go investigate this. So for 1300 years, 
this is what was taught. It becomes normalized, it becomes indoctrinated in the same way that these philosophies and epistemologies become embedded within the praxis of medicine, this idea that Black bodies in particular do not have entree to the same kinds of suffering, thus the same kinds of pain, and thus are farther away from God within the great chain of being. We're really just articulating the work of Aristotle, um, and I'll use work you know, loosely, of Aristotle within you know, this continuation of something that is highly subjective and thus is antithetical to this notion of natural law. So, and so what we're looking at, um, if we're gonna fast forward, right? I'm fast forwarding hundreds and hundreds of years because you know, I got 20 minutes and because <laughs> it's a very nuanced kind of thing. But, um, and so what, what we're, we end up looking at is this idea of the inaccessibility of total pain. Total pain being the kind of thing that we tend to forget is not just about a physical, physiological self, but it is also an emotional self. It is also a cognitive self. It is a social self. The way that you experience pain, the way that pain is articulated is, is often indicative of the way society feels like you should experience pain, right? Why aren't you mourning? Why are they sad? You're sad for too long, <laughs> right? Um, that doesn't hurt. Uh, stop crying. Like there's all of these things that, that are indicative of the spectrum of pain, right? So this idea of total pain specifically um, looks at a couple of different things. The physical, which again, relative to the great chain of being, we did not have entree to because we were considered to be beast or animal. The psychological, again, did not have entree to this because the idea was that if you look at um, the history of, of supposed intellectualism or grades of intellect, um, all, all of those things, you see that there is this idea that the more prognathic the face is, the less intellectual the individual is. And so what was said is that individuals of African ancestry had more mid-face prognathism, their faces stuck out a little bit more, um, which was indicative of less intellectual capability. So again, you also needed intellectual capability to be able to understand the full experience of suffering. And if an individual was not able to understand or tap into the intellectual self because of the prognathism of the face, because they are being associated with a beast or an animal, then they could not experience pain. They could only experience misreception, right? Another aspect of this idea of pain and, and being able to experience pain, again, is, is a very social thing. But if we look at medical anthropology, if we look at the history of sociology and all of those things, you have this articulation of who is civilized or unilineal evolutionism. This idea that you start out with a savage and you go from savage to barbaric to the civilized individual. Well, again, um, brown peoples, particularly African peoples were believed to be at the lower end of unilineal evolutionism. And so what you end up having is the, the sort of imbrication of unilineal evolutionism, um, grades of intellect, and this notion of not quite being human, which made pain, the idea of pain, the, the knowledge is associated with pain, the experience or phenomenology of pain to be inaccessible to specific groups of people. And in this case, Black people. Um, and that brings us to, again, the spiritual aspects of that, because remember, these things are always in dialogue with the great chain of being Aristotle's work and, and that sort of push-pull. And so uh, Bartholomew de la Casa specifically noted that um, people, that Africans in particular, were outside of God's redemptive grace. And because of that, they should be used as slaves. And so he is one of the primary um, individuals that made slavery a very racialized thing as opposed to something that was tied to war. And so all of these things come together, again, um, relative to um, inequitable access to pain medicines and all of those things that I'll get to in just a second. Um, and, but we can see through time and space the examples of um, the relationship between um, 
saying that specific individuals do, do not experience pain and so we can basically do whatever we want to them, right? And so I won't read through this whole thing, um, but I will say so this was one of many instances where uh, slave or other black bodies have been experimented on because there was this idea that they did not have access to pain, that what they were experiencing was what any animal or beast would experience. So um, Fed was a slave who was loaned out um, to a physician who would create blisters, who created a pit in the ground because he wanted to examine heat stroke. And the idea was that Fed would not experience pain because he was not a human, so it wasn't very much of a big deal. Another individual um, I'm sure you guys are very aware of, the father of gynecology, we hold a very high esteem. James Marion Sims was another one of those people who used his slaves in experiments. Um, he did hundreds and hundreds of surgeries on um, roughly 10 or 11 um, uh, black slave women, enslaved women at the time, and he articulated it as the best time of his life. These surgeries were designed to um, help him perfect um, treatment of a vivisection. So the whole, well, they had fistulas essentially. And so they had a hole that exists between the vagina and the rectum, um, which caused the equivalent of a kind of incontinence. Um, and so he did all of these surgeries with no anesthesia, um, particularly because the individuals were, were his property, um, perceived as not existing within that sphere of humanity and because they, you know, um, they didn't experience pain in his eyes. Another example of this is um, Klugman's work. Albert Klugman, if you guys ever use retinol A, or you ever use powder that has talc in it. Um, these things were all um, experimented on in Holmesburg Prison um, in association with the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so over 23 years, Klugman had access to prisoners, which you know now we consider them to be vulnerable populations, but we did, we did then as well, and it was completely disregarded. Um, and they would do things like the gauze test where the individual would lie on the ground and they would cut a two inch cut in the small of the person's back um, and stuff a gauze in it, sew it up and then retrieve it um, a week later. Or um, pour uh, talc powder that had asbestos in it on the body to see how the body would respond. Or um, you know, do varying little cuts or blisters or um, create sunspots on the body. And the idea was that um, these individuals didn't experience pain in the same way of their, their white counterparts, right? This is the normalized body. And also specifically because they are prisoners, again, there's this notion of this being owned by the state. So you, they have experienced a kind of social death. They are not fully human. Right? Again, relative to that great chain of being, they're existing between that space between um, beast and human. And so it ends up being extremely problematic. And we see these things continue to be manifested um, now with things like pain compliance. Pain compliance is a medical health issue. Um, and that all of these things become articulated within the practice of medicine, that they become reinforced with the way that our medical students um, in particular, and, and the culture of medicine um, sort of supports these ideas, these normalizations. Pain compliance as a, as a public health issue specifically is the use of things like the chokehold. Um, and for example, you have Daryl Gates, who was formerly um, a police chief saying that, well, the chokehold is more humane, that it's, it's not about crushing the windpipe, it's about making sure that the veins and the arteries don't have what they need. And so, again, when we look at um, this idea, I'm trying to, there we go. <laughs> when we look at how all of these things play out in the big picture, what we see is the total disregard of the experience of pain for Black people because it is coming out of that great chain of being, this idea that they are not, um, that we are not human, that we exist between humanity and beasts. You see the idea that Black people have thicker skin physically and emotionally, so the phenomenology of emotional pain, psychological pain, and intergenerational trauma 
often disregarded. We see indoctrinated ideas that rearticulate pain as anger or lack of civility, again, noting unilineal evolutionism, this idea of the angry black woman rhetoric, and the normalization and legitimization of inequity, inequitable access to medical services designed to address any of the aforenoted kinds of pain. So pain meds, mental health services, lack of trauma-informed care, deconstruction of racialization in healthcare, um, and the culture of medicine, all of these things, again, being, you know, normalized and coming directly out of this idea that black bodies are not fully human bodies. And because they are, you know, closer to beast and lack cognitive capabilities, that we do not have access to suffering and thus do not have access to pain in the way that pain is contemporarily articulated. So hopefully you, you are realizing how ridiculous this is. <laughs> but also um, recognizing that this has long been uh, normalized within the praxis and epistemologies of medicine. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share and let my counterpart talk about how these things relate in contemporary society. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilson, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, um, Dr. Shepard, for that, that um, really great presentation. So my presentation is going to pick up where Dr. Shepard's left off. Um, a lot of the history, um, I, of course, didn't, um, didn't include that because, of course, she did it very well. And so what my presentation is, is how these things manifest currently in clinical care um, and how we can think about um, pain management as this example of this uh, racist, racist uh, foundation of medicine, its past and its present, um, and looking at how, how this manifestation, manifestation now affects Black people who are trying to seek care. So first, just a little bit to think about, um, thinking about medical racism, right? So medical racism is this idea that we've, we've been talking about for a little while, and you, you can see it at two different levels, at the interpersonal level, as well as the institutional level. And when we're talking about medical racism, I think it's very important to get very clear about what it is, because I think it's a term that has become a little bit more senior. People think that it, it can be just about patients or just about care, but it can also be about those that administer the care. It can be about the very nature of healthcare and clinical care. And so when we think about medical racism, we have to think about how racism can affect healthcare personnel and how it can affect patients. Um, we see it a lot in healthcare personnel thinking about just who even gets to be a physician or a nurse or a therapist, right? We can see racism at the medical school level, just who is at medical school. Right now, almost every medical school in the United States is having a problem with their very low numbers of Black men. And so then you see fewer Black people, particularly Black men, that then go on to be practitioners. And so that is a, a, a more of an institutional. Um, but also you see inter, interpersonal when you hear about different stories from um, and again, I'm focusing on Black people because that is where my specialty lies, but again, can be applied to other kinds of underrepresented groups in medicine. But you hear when you uh, hear stories from Black physicians or Black nurses and, and hearing about their personal experiences with racism from their colleagues or from their patients. Um, that is also medical racism. But also thinking more about patients, I'm going to focus a little bit more on that here and they're the ones that are in this vulnerable position of needing care. Medical racism is when we think about the racist attitudes, the behaviors that we then apply to how we administer care, how we administer healthcare resources. Um, and my research is particularly on the ways that social determinants of health affect Black people's care and how their identities sort of intersect with these oppressive institutions like healthcare. And so one way that we see medical racism uh, being employed is when we ignore the differences in Black people's life opportunities, lack of privileges, and stressors that contribute to their experiences of pain. So it's another way of saying that we can't ignore the social determinants of health that contribute to putting Black people in pain experiences or pain crises that then put them 
in a situation of needing health care. And then also thinking about those social terms of health and how they uh, how they manifest within the clinical setting. So their access to healthcare personnel, the racism that they experience once they are seeking, once they are in a in the care of a practitioner, that is also think that is also a part of their social determinants of health. And so when we're applying this specifically to pain management, we have to think about a few things. One is the differences in access to healthcare. Um, Black people have different levels of, of access given um, their lower numbers of health insurance. And then thinking about the ways that medicine's racist past and present uh, discourages them from seeking healthcare. And so if you put these sort of examples together, you get that Black people have lesser access to health care, and that includes the preventative and curative services that are important to pain care. So I like to think of pain management disparities as in disparities in who gets the different kinds of pain management interventions, who gets the kind of care and the kind of um, empathy, and who gets the kind of just recognition from healthcare providers, and looking at what races get the better care and what races get the lesser care as this sort of manifestation of history of medicine's history with racism and its anti-Black history. So if you sort of keep that in mind as I go throughout that pain management disparities is this sort of manifestation of medicine's um, current and past racism, we can next think about how these are displayed. There we go. So we can see some of these examples of how uh, medical racism is manifested in clinical care. And so one that you often see whenever you read narratives, whenever you read about pathologies from Black people, there's a common theme there of not being trustworthy narrators of their own story, that clinicians don't believe Black people's pain. And a part of that, um, Dr. Shepard did a very good job of showing that this stems from just the very nature of how Black people were seen by clinical researchers and by healthcare practitioners, right, that they were less than human and that they didn't have the same sort of mental capacities that white people did. And so all of that now, whereas some things may not be as blatantly racist, you can still see the racism there in that believing that a Black person doesn't know their body as well as the white caregiver or just a caregiver in general. And so you see this overall problem of Black people having to convince people of their pain. And when you have to convince people of your pain, you have to convince them of your humanity. And if you're trying too hard to do that for people who have this mental block with your humanity, they're never going to be able to see your pain. And that's the ultimate problem. Other ways we see this, um, different research of medical records which show that uh, dopioids are used very differently for Black people. Recently, a, a policy, uh, recently a, a congressman made the comment that this, the opioid epidemic, opioid crisis in America, that Black people were saved from it because uh, they weren't prescribed opioids as much, right? So sort of trying to change this, this negative into a positive, but really what that just means is Black people weren't getting adequate care. And you also see that when uh, Black people are given opioids, they will be given that while they are under observation in a clinical setting, but they won't be sent home with their prescription for it or at lower rates than white people. Or even when they are, then they will undergo more screening for misuse of opioids. They'll have more urine tests than white people. And they'll be referred to, um, to counselors to help them manage their, their pain, um, their use of pain drugs more than white people. So it's just, just this general suspicion that Black people have to undergo. And again, it all stems from this very history and the very nature of medicine. Um, you often hear about in different narratives for when Black people were denied uh, COVID-19 care, that they would come in and say that they were short of breath or that they were having chest pains. Um, and they were told maybe it's anxiety to go home or they were denied tests to see if it was COVID-19. Um, so that's something very contemporary that you're seeing right now. Another one is in cardiology. If you look at different surveys of cardiologists, um, they, there's some very just honest takes from them, which I appreciate. They're not great, but they are honest. So I do appreciate that. But that Black people's complaints of chest pain um, are often ignored. And that contributes to Black people's higher rates of cardiovascular disease and their higher rates of cardiovascular death. Um, and, and again, this is from cardiologists themselves. So a, a lot of times people will push back on me and say, well, you know, this is just anecdotal, but 
and we'll talk about next why even stories and themselves are important, but this is coming from cardiologists themselves. Um, we all know that we have higher uh, birthing mortality is higher for black people. Louisiana is the most dangerous place, place for a black person to give birth. Um, I'm in Texas right now and ours is not, not, not too much better actually. Um, and then we also see it in higher rates of cancer. And again, these last two come back to the very first point that I made is about believing black people's pain. When black people complain of, having breast pain or they complain, complain of um, not feeling well or they complain of fatigue, um, these sort of things, if, especially if they can't be proved with a diagnostic test, um, that they can be ignored. And, and even when they can be proved with diagnostic tests, having to fight to get the diagnostic test is its own battle in itself. And so something to think about that we can talk about um, during q and I'll try to make sure we have plenty of time for that, is to think about what does racial justice and pain management for Black people require of healthcare, of medicine, of public health, of public officials, right? So to think about what will it, what will it take to get proper care for Black people? One thing that I always like to do, um, I am a, a, I'm a bioethicist, but I am also a, a medical humanities scholar. One thing that's very important to me is to always highlight Black people's stories because too often we're told that the stories are not proper research or not proper evidence. We're told that they're anecdotal, right? We're told that um, if it can't be proved by this research, then it's not worthy, but our stories are research in themselves. Our stories matter. And I think sometimes we talk about this history, this history, and sometimes people can get very desensitized, even though they shouldn't, because history is, is so important to what we're talking about right now. But I think sometimes giving a face can also matter. And so very quickly, I want to give you the story of, of Miss Jamma. Um, you can go online and, and look up this story. Ms. Jamma um, was, went to the emergency room um, after losing consciousness, after being in extreme pain. And in the emergency room, she kept losing consciousness and her doctors would not do perform a uh, diagnostic test on her and kept telling her to go home, take some over-the-counter pills, take some ibuprofen. But she says that in her own words, she had to keep being told to take ibuprofen to go home because she kept losing consciousness. And so she spent weeks with these same sort of episodes of calling EMTs, being told there's nothing wrong with you or having her family members take her to the hospital and being told you're okay, go home, it's just period pain. Um, ultimately, when she finally reached a doctor that would allow her to undergo diagnostic tests, she was told that she was having endometriosis crisis and that, um, that her pain would, was very similar to childbirth. And so it took multiple doctors, it took her um, expending money time from uh, straining her familiar relationships. It took so much effort on her part to just finally be listened to, to get the care that she needed. And so what one thing, a few things that her story tells us about pain management for Black people um, is to think about how intersectionality influences pain management. She is a woman uh, and then she also is a Black woman. So thinking about how biases in healthcare can intersect, right? So thinking about how Black people's identities intersect with oppressive institutions that then reflect their poor health outcomes. Um, and then thinking about what being in pain means. It costs money, right? Hopefully she has good health insurance. If she doesn't, then that's even more money, right? Even health insurance costs still costs us a lot of money, right? The emotional pain, the mental pain, the familiar toll of, of having different access to healthcare because of your skin color. Um, and then this is maintained by the culture of medicine institutional policies, right? About when you can when you can say here is a test, when we can administer diagnostic tests, when we can say um, you deserve more um, attention from these healthcare personnel. It is a part of medicine to manage people's pain, but manage people's pains very differently depending on race, depending on gender, depending on class, depending on these other identities. And I think what ultimately gets left out of thinking about Black pain management is that it is unjust and unethical to leave people in pain. We've all, pain is one of the few guarantees in life. We've all had some level of pain and pain is a life disruptor. Uh, you cannot 
pursue your hobbies, your career, your family time, your friend time, whatever it is that you want to do, pain can stop you from living the life that you want to live. And if you are unjustly making that more applicable to Black people, then you are unjustly leaving them in pain and unjustly withholding a life that they want to live from them. And I think ultimately about Black patient narratives and stories, what's important to me is that they show that uh, Black people can be, their stories are seen as illegitimate. Their words are seen as illegitimate sources of knowledge and investigation. When you're not believed, it, it is something saying that you yourself are an illegitimate person in this setting. It also contributes to Black people's invisibility in healthcare, right? It's this, this counterbalance of being hyper-visible, but then also being invisible. And I think that that's what really makes me upset when we think about Black people having lesser access to pain management. I didn't go into all of that research. You can do that on your own, but it is there, all the different um, all the different research that shows that Black people receive less pain care than white people. Um, but it, it makes them it's sort of non-existent. And then also, like I've been saying, it makes them not trustworthy narratives of their own stories. And if you take people's stories away from them, you're taking their humanity away. You're taking their voice away. You're taking their ability to be advocates for themselves. Um, and that is one of the ultimate problems. And we can talk about this in Q&A as well. Um, I have, if you, oops, sorry, if you've ever seen any work from me, I have mixed emotions about empathy. I don't think that empathy in healthcare is the ultimate goal. I think justice is, but this is one example of how um, you can sort of use stories and you can use the humanity of Black people to try to uh, help them get better pain care and get them the care that they need. There's a study with Black and white nurses about viewing the facial expressions of people in pain and how those facial expressions and how imagining themselves in that role has affected how they treat these patients. Um, again, I have mixed emotions, we'll talk about this. I don't think this should be necessary, but this is at least one example of that. I think it should not take you seeing someone imagining how they feel to, to believe that they're in pain. If, if you're a human, you can experience pain and that should be the end of it. And lastly, I'll end here. I always, um, I, I usually in my presentations with this slide and over the years, I've given a lot of presentations on this topic and I will add to them and I keep adding them. So maybe during Q&A again, we can add more. And these are just some of the things because I think a lot of times people ask, well, what can I do as a researcher, as a physician to sort of, can, uh, to sort of help uh, racial disparities in, in healthcare and in health outcomes, particularly pain management. And these are just some of the things, I won't go over all of them, but I think partially you can set the tone in your office about what kind of behaviors won't be tolerated. You can support local advocacy groups. When you're doing your research, you can include patients of color, you can interrogate your own biases, you can recommend patients of color for clinical trials. And so I think that there's always something that everyone can do. It's not just a matter of I have to go and lobby Congress. It's not that I have to completely change Black people's access to social determinants of health. There's always something that everyone can do and and even these small things can, can contribute to the larger problem. So I will stop there and, and um, turn it over to Dr. Wilson for Q&A. Absolutely wonderful. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm me, I think I'm speechless by the information that was provided. So let's absolutely get into the chat. If there's more questions, um, that you all want to put in, um, then put them into the chat, but I'm going to go just immediately up into, you know, to the top of what I've been get, um, you know, that's been put in thus far. One of the things that has, um, that came in kind of early on, the studies that you all have utilized, like reference lists um, that's been asked about, is there any way that you all can share that? How can the um, participants get that information um, in regards to your reference list? They would like that information. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. we can share that. I have lists that I usually give out to students who email me and also um, lots of students email me. So feel free to, to do that as well. Lots of people who want to know information or have conversations. Uh, my email should have been on the first slide, but I'll put it in the chat. Okay, wonderful. Um, so the next question, 
um, that was in here. Um, it was, um, but the, um, they would love to hear about methods for combating systemic racism in the clinic, both on an interpersonal level and on an institutional level, if possible. Right. So, so um, oh, I'll just give a few a few things that I usually tell students because, um, especially if you are, you have to think about first your your level of power, right? So one thing I always tell people who are, are my medical students is to think about, um, you have to think about your career. So I get that there's a lot of considerations to think about. Um, you don't want to destroy your career and that's very important to people. But if you are in a, a situation where you have the ability to call out behavior in an anonymous way, I think that's very important to not overlook bad behavior and to not overlook racist behavior. If you see a clinician that is displaying racist behavior, um, you have to say something because if you don't, that behavior continues. And we have this sort of, um, with the hidden curriculum where students learn from watching clinicians do it and then they will continue to do it. Um, as a medical school educator, I, I am very enthused by my students who, who use this method and who use their, their poor examples as examples of things that they don't want to do. And I think that that's great. Um, I also think in interpersonal relationships, you know, again, I, I, I come from a place of trying to make sure that people don't ruin their careers because, you know, medical school is a long time, bioethics, you're, you're, you're in school for a long time, these kinds of things. I also think that there's a lot of power in the not laugh, right? There's a lot of power in the, that joke is not funny. There's a lot of power in these interpersonal relationships when you don't respond to people who are, who are saying racist or sexist or homophobic things, right? I think there's a lot of power in that. But I also think there's a lot of power in being on committees in your institution and being a, a, a sponsor of change. I also think that there is a lot of power in setting tones when you are in a position of power in your labs, in your offices, of, of saying these things will not be tolerated and having repercussions for those actions. I think there have to be some sort of repercussions. I'll turn it over. Yeah, so I was gonna, so I have a couple of things. One of which I think uh, that one of the most important things is, is being able to recognize and articulate that it is systemic, that it is institutionalized. I think that's one of the major issues that we see within the culture and history of medicine is that we haven't yet come to a place where we're even acknowledging that these things exist. You know what I mean? Um, we're so busy saying that everything is objective and, and, and that's a falsehood. It's an, an imaginarium that doesn't benefit um, the kinds of physicians that we're hoping to produce. So that's one of the first things. Um, one of the other things that I often tell, um, again, many of my students and colleagues, et cetera, is be conscious of your language. One of the things that we see in cases when we're doing uh, PBLs and all of these things is you'll, you'll notice that the word denies come up especially like when clinicians are writing their notes, oh, denies alcoholism, denies opioid use, denies all of these things. And what you're really saying is that I don't trust this individual to have the cognitive capacity to articulate their own experience, right? I don't trust that you know whether or not you're a smoker. I don't trust that you know whether or not you're an opioid user, right? Um, that goes back to this, again, this notion of intellect um, and also the, the articulation, the phenomenology of that individual's experience, right? So you remove a little bit of their humanity by simply saying that you feel like they, they deny. And you can look it up at your leisure. Deny is a judgment call <laughs> all day long. All day long, it is a judgment call. You do not have the cognitive capacity to speak for yourself. So just being conscious of the language that you use when you are engaging with individuals and when you are articulating, because really you're starting to do a second and third person when you're writing your notes, right? When you are articulating somebody else's experience, how are you doing those things? Another thing that I think that we can do is um, you know, when you're engaging or even, you know, when you're thinking about what your role is, ask yourself why. This is one of the things I tell my students all the time. For example, I have a student who is doing like the most brilliant work into, you know, osteopathic um, injuries, sports injuries. And he's like, oh, Dr. Shepard, I want to be able to break this down into diversity. And I said, okay, 
So are the you know experiences of back injuries different for black people than you know do black <laughs> athletes hurt their backs in a different way? Is it like an ethnic break, <laughs> right? Why are you doing that? There's no such thing as an ethnic break, right? If you broke your wrist, you broke your wrist. If you have carpal tunnel, you don't have Hispanic carpal tunnel, right? There's no Asian carpal tunnel. So why do we feel like we have to compartmentalize and racialize so many of these things? And the reason for that is because it has been normalized. It has been legitimized. So when you're doing this work and you're applying for these amazing NIH grants and they're like, talk about diversity, ask yourself, why? Is this relevant? to my overall hypothesis? Is this relevant to this conversation that I'm having? If I'm saying that a person has stage four cancer, does it matter if the individual is from uptown or downtown or if they are Tamil or Chukis or if they are black or are they white, does it matter or do they just have stage four cancer? And often what happens is, is we'll say black female with da 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 da. When you do your rounds, that's what they say, black female with da 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 da. But why does that, why does that change anything, right? And so start asking yourself the why and requiring the people who are within your purview to ask themselves the why. Why is, you know, why is there such a thing as racialized medicine? Why are we still using vital? Why do we feel like we have to articulate things like this different kind of you know, ethnic backbreak, you sound ridiculous. <laughs> and, and just to kind of wrap that up, I was just gonna say, one of the examples that I always use is that, that you can immediately think of is why do we say things like black on black crime? Sounds perfectly normal. You have never heard Japanese on Japanese crime. What about Chukis on Chukis crime? <laughs> Asian Pacific Islander on Asian Pacific Islander crime? No, these things, they sound ridiculous. And they sound ridiculous because the language that we have attributed to these experiences have not been normalized in that way. And that same kind of ideological framework, same kinds of epistemologies and philosoph um, philosophies have been embedded in the culture of medicine, such that you got a tickle in your throat, you must have sarcoidosis, right? <laughs> because you're black, so it's that same thing. Right. And then just to add on to the language part, um, I do this lecture for for uh, graduate researchers who are not in the clinical care and who have no intentions of ever being in the clinical setting, but they do research. And I tell them that there's little things that you can do, like when you're putting a chart into your research, do you always order it with white first, right? How do you use the term non-black, right? And that makes these this othering situation as if there there is a a, a race that it's always the counter to, uh, like Dr. Shepard said during her talk. Um, and then even thinking about being very intentional with your language. If you mean African American, use African American. But if you mean black, use black. If you uh, use Asian, you better think that you are meaning a lot of different kinds of people, right? Try to be very intentional with your language and not just using these groups, uh, these sort of terms that can mean lots of different people with lots of different ethnic background. And then to think about your research, how will your research affect people differently? I think Dr. Sharper did a great job of saying, you know, there's some things that obviously these are everyone has carpal tunnel syndrome in the same way, but there are some things where their social determinants will affect people differently. And you can't ignore that part in your research. So you have to ask yourself, um, are you just generalizing, right? So there's this, this article um, that I wrote this commentary to, and they said the general public believes X and 90% of their participants were white. That's what I mean by language. That's not the general public. You can no way say that 90% of white people represent the general public. So just be very intentional with your language and be very careful with your language. And, and just to uh, piggyback on that, and I know Dr. Wilson is just like, honey, we have questions. Y'all are piggybacking, <laughs> we have questions. <laughs> This is, so, this is so good, but no, go ahead, Dr. Shepard, no, um, go. Yeah, I told y'all I'm from New Orleans, darling, you know, we just, that's what we do, but um, so one of the things that, that Dr. Ray brings to mind that I found, find extraordinarily problematic, I'm always screaming the bubble about, is being able to delineate the difference between what is genetic and what is environmental, 
And what you find, especially um, now when we're talking about precision medicine, personal medicine, all of those things, genome-wide association studies that actually use, you know, race as a variable in gen genetic and genomic studies, which totally different talk, but totally different time, but wildly problematic. But what you find is that end of, that many groups of people, particularly in their research, take environmental or social processes and factors. And because it has a high prevalence, right? Because of a particular pathology or experience of a high prevalence, they assume that it is genetic and it's not. So if you have a lot of people who are living on a toxic waste dump, and so then you start to see a lot of cancers, those cancers exist because they live on a toxic waste dump, right? That's an environmental um, variable. It's not because they're black and live on the toxic waste dump because if you put any human body in that environment, regardless of race or ethnicity, they will end up with a lot of cancers. And so much, you know, that many times what ends up happening is people say, well, this particular group has a genetic propensity towards, for example, these cancers, and that's not true. They only have a high prevalence because of an environmental or social factor. And so I think in terms of intrapersonal and interpersonal work that you guys are doing, I, I would ask, you know, hashtag beg please while screaming in the bubble, making a point to disaggregate those moments in which you want to say that this is a genetic propensity and, and it's not. It's a high environmental um, presence. So, you know, just be conscious of that. And that's a way that you can push up against some of those systemic issues. And that's a way that you can actually start to articulate um, some of the problems that exist within medical inequities and, and how Black bodies are often articulated as um, being inherently diseased or inherently ill or inherently abnormal, right? And to use Aristotle's terms, right? Dr. Shepard, Dr. Ray, um, <laughs> We don't have enough time for for what we need to cover in just this hour. I mean, we could talk for hours on these topics. And so, you know, maybe another time we can bring you back for another topic and cover, you know, much more needed information. So thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, you have been, you, you've graced us with this information. I will turn it back over to Dr. Hansen, Dr. Dukas to close us out um, today. Thank you, Dr. Ray, and thank you, Dr. Shepard, for an outstanding presentation that was extremely thought-provoking. Uh, thought and uh, if you look at the chat box, you'll be able to have a chance to see the four to seven hours of uh, <laughs> interchange that would have been precipitated if we'd been able to get to all of the different questions. So I, I really do appreciate your uh, participating in the Williams lecture today. Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you for your invite. Thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate you all. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dugas. Thank you, Dr. Hansen.